parts of the tongue and how each works. The tongue is a muscular organ in the mouth. The tongue is covered with moist pink tissue called mucosa. The surface of the tongue is covered with small projections called papillae. Within the papillae are the taste receptors or taste buds. Each taste bud consists of a number of sense cells that are responsible for receiving different taste sensations. Papillae have taste buds, so you can taste everything. People are born with 10,000 buds. As person ages, some of the taste buds die. An old person may have at least 5,000 taste buds. This is the reason why some food may taste stronger for you than for an adult. Taste buds can distinguish the basic types of tastes. Sweet, salty, bitter, and sour. Only recently, a Japanese scientist discovered the fifth basic taste, which is umami. Umami means pleasant and savory taste. Examples are cheese and steaks. The food that you put into your mouth mixes with your saliva. The saliva wets and dissolves the food particles. The taste receptors that react to the chemicals in the food receive the message and send it to your brain. Then the brain tells you what the taste is. The sense of taste and the sense of smell are closely related with each other. Have you experienced having difficulty tasting food when you have a cold? It is hard to taste food when you have a cold. This is because the sensation of taste is related with the sensation of smell. If the nose is blocked, you cannot detect the taste of food very well. Your nose is congested so your sense of smell is affected and so is your sense of taste. Animals of the same kind but different in some ways or characteristics. Tortoises and turtles. Tortoises and turtles look very much alike. Most tortoises live on land. Most turtles live in water. Both of them have a pair of toothless jaws with sharp edges for cutting up food. Tortoises eat plants only, while some turtles eat plants and others eat mostly meat. Both of them have a hard shell for shelter and protection. Other animals like snails and clams are also covered with shells. Can you name other animals with bodies that are covered with shells? Please comment down below. Chickens and Pigeons Chickens and pigeons belong to the group of animals called birds. They both have beaks and claws which they use to get food. Both of them have a pair of wings. Pigeons can fly from one place to another. Chickens have wings too, but they cannot fly high. Sometimes they flap their wings to fly over a short distance. Chickens cannot stay in the air for a long time. Pigeons and chickens are covered with feathers. Can you name other animals with feathers? Please comment down below. Crocodiles and Alligators Crocodiles and alligators are large animals with bodies covered with dry and bumpy scales. They have long powerful tails which they use in swimming and defending themselves. Their eyes, ears, and nostrils are found on top of their long head, which they show slightly above the water when they float on the surface. Alligators have a shorter and wider head that is more U-shaped, while crocodiles have a longer V-shaped head.
The fangs of crocodiles stick out on each side of the lower jaw when their mouth is closed. Other animals that are covered with scales are lizards and snakes. Butterflies and moths Butterflies and moths are both insects. They are so much alike that it is sometimes hard to know one from the other. Both have two wings. They also have antennae, which they use for touching and smelling. They both hatch from caterpillars, which look like worms. Butterflies and moths have differences too. Butterflies have long, slender, and hairless bodies, while moths have thick and furry bodies. Butterflies fly only during the day, and when resting, they fold their wings straight up. Moths usually fly at night, and when resting, they spread their wings flat. Different animals that are similar in some ways. Fish and whales. Whales look a lot like fish. Both have tails and fins, but there are some differences between these two animals. Whales have smooth, firm skin. Fish have scales. Whales have tails called flukes that they move up and down when they swim. Fish have tails that they swing from side to side. Whales breathe with lungs and must hold their breath while underwater. They come to the water surface to breathe in fresh air. Fish, on the other hand, breathe underwater by using their gills. Bats and birds Before, people used to think bats were birds without feathers. We now know that there is no such thing as a featherless bird. Bats are mammals and birds are part of the bird family. Bats have fur on their bodies like cats and dogs. Birds have feathers covering their bodies. Bats are born alive from their mother's body. A bird hatches from eggs. Baby bats are called pups. Pups drink milk from their mothers. A baby bird eats worm and bugs that the mother brings. Birds have wings. Bats have wings with arms that look like long fingers. Spiders and insects. Both spiders and insects are invertebrates, but there are several distinct characteristics that separate spiders from insects. If you will look closely at a spider and an insect, you can see how different they are. An insect has three main body parts. The head is in front. The thorax is the next part. The abdomen is behind the thorax. Most insects have wings. Insects also have six legs attached to their chest. A spider has two main body parts. The head and chest make one part. The abdomen is behind. A spider has eight legs and no wings. Renewable and Non-Renewable Resources The planet Earth is a good place to live in because it provides us with all the things we need. It is rich in natural resources. A natural resource is anything that comes from the Earth which people use. Natural resources are grouped into renewable resources and non-renewable resources. Renewable resources are resources that can be replaced in a short span of time. Non-renewable resources are resources that are limited in supply. They cannot be replaced at once when they are used up. Renewable resources Plants and animals Plants and animals are renewable resources because they can reproduce and replace themselves. People eat food that comes from plants. Farmers plant new crops after each harvest. The crops which people eat are replaced by new ones. 
People also eat some animals. The animals are replaced when young ones are born. Plants and animals need each other. If plants are abused, animals are badly affected. The excessive cutting down of trees can affect the lives of plants and animals. This bad practice can also affect the quality of water and soil. Water Another renewable resource is water. Water is important to humans. You use water in your everyday activities. You use water for drinking, washing plates, washing clothes, and taking a bath. Water is important to animals. Animals need water to live and grow. Without water, animals will die. Water also serves as the habitat of sea animals. Water is important to plants. Plants need water to live and grow. Without water, plants will also die. There will always be the same amount of water on Earth. However, the problem is the quality of water that we use. Do you drink clean and fresh water? Where do you get the water that you drink? Water can be replaced. Water in rivers dry up, but when rain comes, the lost water is replaced. Non-renewable resources. There are resources that cannot be replaced easily or cannot be replaced at all when used up. They are called non-renewable resources. Examples are coal, natural oil and gas, and minerals such as diamond, gold, silver, platinum, and copper. People are fast using up these minerals. They dig mines to get coal and precious minerals. They drill wells to get oil and natural gas. Coal and oil are important energy resources. Coal is a black material that is used as fuel. Oil, which is also known as petroleum, is a black and thick liquid that is used to make gasoline, diesel, and jet fuel. Natural gas goes with oil and coal. Just like coal and oil, it is also used as fuel to produce electricity. People use much electricity, so more and more fuels are used up. Scientists say that there will come a time when these fuels will be used up or completely consumed. Coal, natural gas, and oil were formed underground after a very long time. Once they are used up, they cannot be replaced as easily as water and plants can be. Minerals composing the rocks and soil are also non-renewable resources. Soil, an important natural resource. Soil is a very important natural resource on Earth. It is very useful to plants, animals, and humans. Most plants grow on soil. The roots of these plants get water and minerals from the soil. Some animals, like earthworms and ants, live in the soil because there is air in the spaces between soil particles. People plant crops like rice and corn in the soil. These crops are sources of food. Crops can be grown on the same land again and again for years if the soil is properly taken care of. If the soil is washed away, it will take hundreds and hundreds of years before it can be replaced. It cannot be replaced easily, so the soil is also considered a non-renewable resource. Conserving our natural resources Will there be enough natural resources on Earth for people to use? We all have to be concerned about whether or not there will always be enough natural resources for the future. We have to do something to conserve our natural resources. Conservation means saving the things that come from nature like air, soil, water, animals, and plants. Here are some ways to conserve our natural resources. Conserve the use of electricity. 
The less electricity you use, the lesser fuel is consumed. Wild animals should be preserved. If you kill one, you harm the others too. Help plant new trees. People and animals will benefit from them. As much as possible, apply the principle of reduce, reuse, recycle in the way you use and dispose materials or things. Reduce means to make less. Reuse means to use a product over and over again in the same form. Recycle means to go through a new process in order to be used again. Do you know why should recycle things? Recycling is the solution to extend the supply of non-renewable resources such as metals. Tin cans and glass bottles are made from minerals and other materials. These materials are recycled by melting them and making them into new tin cans and bottles. Plastic bottles can be recycled. They can be cleaned and refilled or melted and molded into other plastic products such as flower boxes. Answer the following. 1. What are natural resources? 2. What is the difference between the renewable and non-renewable resources? Give two examples for each. Branches of Science and Scientists What is science? Science is learning new things. Would you believe that the repositioning of the teeth makes it possible to rejuvenate facial appearance by reshaping the jaw, neck, and lips? That is what today's orthodontics is. Inventing New Things Greater things have happened since the invention of the television. Now, satellites send television signals around the world. These satellites allow people to see live broadcasts from all over the world. Exploring the Unknown In 1609, Galileo was the first person to study the moon through a telescope. Eventually, the Hubble telescope was launched into space. It has captured images of the solar system and other heavenly bodies. In your science class, you observe, you learn, and you discover new things through experiments by using different laboratory apparatuses. You work like young scientists. Scientists are experts in the study of different branches of science. You learn many things from their discoveries and inventions. Branches of Science Here are the different branches of science. Biology is the study of living things including their structure, function, and growth. An expert in the field of biology is called a biologist. Botany is the study of plants including the characteristics of plant parts, how plants make food, and how they reproduce. An expert in the field of botany is called a botanist. Zoology is a study of animals including the structure, habits, and distribution of all animals. An expert in the field of zoology is called a zoologist. Chemistry is the science of the composition, structure, properties, and reaction of matter. An expert in the field of chemistry is called a chemist. Physics is the science of matter and energy and the interaction between them. An expert in the field of physics is called a physicist. Ecology is the study of how organisms interact with one another. An expert in ecology is called an ecologist. Geology is the study of Earth's rocks and features in land and the changes that the Earth is undergoing. An expert in geology is called a geologist. Meteorology is the study of weather and climate. An expert in the field of meteorology is called a meteorologist. 
Astronomy is the study of heavenly bodies. An expert in the field of astronomy is called an astronomer. Taxonomy is the science of classification of plants and animals. A scientist who studies taxonomy is called a taxonomist. The scientists. People who are experts in the field of science are called scientists. Here are some of the famous scientists and their works. Foreign scientists. Louis Pasteur was a French scientist who became famous for his work on fermentation and decay. His experiments supported the germ theory of disease, which showed how microorganisms such as bacteria and viruses can cause diseases. He is also credited for the practice of vaccination to prevent disease. Nicholas Copernicus was a monk from Poland. He went against the idea that the Earth was the center of the universe and all the stars and other planets revolve around it. Through his research, he made a Copernican model of the solar system and proposed that the Sun is the center of the universe and all the planets revolve around it. Thomas Alva Edison was a very curious child. He loved to experiment. To earn money to support his experiments, he went to work at the age of 12, selling newspapers and candies on trains. At the age of 22, he already made many inventions. He worked day and night. One of his famous inventions was the phonograph, a device that makes and records sounds. In addition, he improved the electric light bulb and Alexander Graham Bell's telephone. Filipino Scientists Arturo Alcaraz Arturo Alcaraz is considered the father of Philippine geothermal energy development. He is credited for making the Philippines the world's second largest producer of geothermal energy. For his contributions in geology, he won the Ramon Magsaysay Award in 1982. Rolando de la Cruz Rolando de la Cruz was awarded Outstanding Technology Gregorio Izara Medal for his various herbal and antiviral products. From the extract of cashew nuts and other herbs, de la Cruz came up with healing creams for warts, moles, and fungi infection. His most popular products are the mole and the wart. His inventions won at the class award from the Department of Science and Technology. Since then, he has won gold medals at Inventors' Fair in many countries. Dr. Fedel Mundo was a Filipino pediatrician. She founded the first pediatric hospital in the Philippines. She was also known for the invention of the improved incubator and the jaundice relieving device. She dedicated her life to the cause of pediatric medicine in the Philippines. She was the first Filipino woman to be named as a National Scientist of the Philippines. Types of Landforms and Their Effect on Living Things There are many different types of landforms on Earth. Some of them were formed over millions of years ago. Others were formed in a matter of hours. The formation of a mountain range, for example, would surely take a million years. Events like earthquakes and volcanic eruptions can wipe out landforms or form new ones in a matter of hours. Here are some common examples of natural landforms. Mountains. Mountains are large, tall, rocky areas of land that come up out of Earth's surface. The highest landform on Earth is Mount Everest in Nepal. It stands 8,848.86 meters above sea level. Mountains are very important in many ways. Mountains have a great role in the survival of many organisms, including man, animals, and plants. 
There are mountains in a chain called ranges that are thickly forested and serve as a sanctuary for many different organisms. The growth of trees and vegetation provides shelter and food for many species. Mountains also serve as protection from harsh weather conditions or very strong winds. During heavy rains or snowstorms, the galleys serve as drainages that make water flow to the surrounding lower areas. The flowing water irrigates vegetation. With the flow of water, many minerals are carried along that help improve the growth of plants. The rivers and streams also help in keeping the constant supply of fresh water to lakes and other bodies of water. Deserts Deserts are areas that receive little or no rain throughout the years. They are known to have some of the harshest conditions on earth. They have dry air and a lot of wind. They can be very hot or very cold too. During daytime, the temperature in the desert is very high, thus it is very hot. At night time, the temperature drops steeply, thus it becomes very cold. A cold desert has snow in the winter. Although being cold or dry empty land, deserts play an important role in helping people, plants, animals, and the environment. Most deserts are home to plants and animals that have adapted to the harsh environment. Desert animals like camels have been helpful and reliable pack animals for thousands of years. Desert plants such as dates are an important food source in North Africa and the Middle East. Valleys A valley has two types. One is lowland and the other is formed between hills and mountains. At the bottom of many valleys is fertile soil which makes excellent farmlands. Most valleys on dry land are formed by the running water of streams and rivers. Valleys in lowlands have average slopes. Valleys in mountains have deep, narrow slopes. Narrow, deep valleys are sometimes called canyons. A canyon is a deep valley with very steep sides and are often large cracks on earth caused by a river or an earthquake. Plains Plains are a large area of flat land. Plant life on plains is controlled by the climate. Thick forests usually thrive in humid climate and grasslands cover fairly dry plains. Plains are usually populated because the soil and terrain are good for farming. Also, roads and railways can easily be built between towns and cities. Volcanoes A volcano is an opening in Earth's crust where lava, dust, and gases are ejected into the surface during eruptions. The most prominent part of a volcano is its cone, which is formed by the mountainous accumulation of volcanic materials. Its other parts are the crater, which is a steep wall depression at the peak of the volcano, and the volcanic vent, which is a cylindrical channel that connects the mouth to the magma chamber. Mount Mayon, Mount Taal, and Mount Pinatubo are examples of active volcanoes in the Philippines. Volcanic eruptions can cause a serious impact on living things, the economy, and the environment. However, volcanic activities can also produce some benefits because of the very rich nature of the ejected materials. Volcanic activities have created some of the most scenic and fertile regions in the Philippines. The biggest abaca plantation in the Philippines is located near Mount Mayon. The rice granary of the Philippines is located in the central plain of the sun in the surrounding areas of Mount Pinatubo.
pieces of matter. Matter is made up of tiny particles called molecules. Molecules are made up of still tinier particles called atoms. Molecules can join together to form larger molecules. Molecules of matter are arranged differently in the different phases of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. Matter exists in three phases, solid, liquid, and gas. Solids In solids, the molecules are held firmly by the force of attraction between them. The molecules in solids move through vibration, and they are very close to each other. They are compressed, so solids can keep their size and shape. Solids have definite shape and volume. If you take a block of wood and put it first in a pail with water and then in a plastic bag, you will see that its size and shape do not change. Examples of solids are stone, wood, pencil, scissors, book, chair, and bag. Solids also have special properties. Hardness is the property of solid to resist scratching or abrasion. For example, we can use a fingernail to scratch a piece of chalk. If the chalk can be scratched, we describe the chalk as soft and the fingernail that scratch it as hard. Diamond is the hardest material on earth. This is the reason why diamonds are used to cut other materials such as glass and tiles. Malleability is the ability of materials to be pressed, hammered, or rolled into various shapes and sizes without breaking. Observe a gold ring or a pair of earrings. Gold can be molded and hammered into different shapes without being broken. Gold is malleable. Brittleness is the tendency of a material to be easily broken into pieces. What do you think will happen to a glass when you drop it accidentally? The glass will surely break into pieces. The glass that breaks into pieces exhibits brittleness. Can you name other brittle materials? Elasticity is the property of solid materials to be stretched when pressure is applied on them. Some solids, like rubber bands, are elastic. You can stretch a rubber band to twice its length when pressure is applied. The rubber band will go back to its original length and shape when the pressure is removed. A thin wire can stretch a little if you hang weight on the wire. If the weight is not too heavy, the wire will return to its original length when the weight is removed. Strength Metals are used to construct buildings, bridges and roads because they are very strong. Iron and steel are examples of metals that are used to support buildings and other structures. They are also used for making steel chairs and cabinets. Solids made of strong materials do not wear out easily. Liquids Compared to molecules of solids, the molecules in liquids are farther apart from each other. The force of attraction among the molecules is weak. They always move, roll, slide, or bump each other. This is the reason why liquids can change shape. Liquids take the shape of their container. Other characteristics of liquids. Fill a one liter jar with water. Then, remove about half of the water from the container. Pour the water back to the jar. This shows that water takes up a definite amount of space. Liquids have definite volume, but no definite shape. Liquids expand when heated. Their molecules move faster and the space between the molecules increases. When the liquids are cooled, they contract. Liquids may dissolve some solids. When sugar is placed in water, it melts or dissolves. Sugar breaks up in water and spreads out. Some liquids, like water, flow easily. 
Other liquids like oil flow very slowly. Liquids that flow very slowly are described as viscous. Viscosity is the resistance of liquid to flow. This is because the molecules in a viscous material are strongly attached to each other, which flows easily. Evaporated milk or condensed milk. The condensed milk, which does not flow easily, is more viscous than evaporated milk, which flows easily. Gases. In gases, the molecules are farther apart compared to those of liquids. The molecules bounce off and move in every direction. The force of attraction between the molecules is too weak to hold them close. Take a closed, half-filled bottle of perfume. Now, remove the top cover. Can you smell the scent of the perfume? The molecules of the perfume spread out and fill the room. And soon, everyone inside the room can smell the scent of the perfume. The attraction among molecules of any gas is weak, so they can change both their shape and volume. Air is an example of gas. Air is colorless, tasteless, and invisible. Air can be squeezed or compressed. As you press the balloon, it feels harder and occupies a smaller space. Air can be pushed from both sides, left and right. Moreover, air has heaviness. This heaviness is also called weight. Examples of gases are oxygen, carbon dioxide, and liquefied petroleum gas, LPG. Plant Parts and Their Functions Let us now study the characteristics of roots, leaves, stems, and flowers of plants. Roots The roots hold the plant to the ground. They absorb water and minerals from the soil and bring them up to the stem and leaves. Roots have three main parts primary root, secondary roots, and root hairs. The first root to develop from the seed is the primary root. The primary root is the largest root to form in a plant. It usually grows straight down into the soil. Later, secondary roots form. Secondary roots are small roots that branch out from the primary root. The root hairs grow from the secondary roots. They are very fine roots. They look like short pieces of string attached to the secondary roots. Some roots grow in unusual places above the ground. They are called adventitious roots. These roots provide additional support for some trees and plants with tall, thin, and soft stems. Types of root systems There are two types of root systems, the top root system and the fibrous root system. Some plants have a large and well-developed primary root that grows deep into the soil. This is called the top root system. In some plants like carrots and radish, the top root becomes thick and fleshy due to some stored materials. In other plants, the primary root stops from growing. Instead, many secondary roots that are almost equal in size grow from it. This well-developed secondary root system is called the fibrous root system. Corn, rice, grass, and oat have a fibrous root system. Some plants have specialized roots. Observe the roots of a sugarcane plant. It has roots that grow from the lower part of the stem above the ground. These roots are called prop roots. They help support the plant so it can stand erect even when the wind blows hard. Prop roots are examples of adventitious roots. 
Observe the roots of orchids. These plants have roots that cling to the branches of trees. These roots are called aerial roots. Aerial roots get water from the air. Stems. The stem is the part of the plant where leaves, flowers, and fruits are attached. In most plants, the main stem forms many branches. These branches are also part of the stem. Stems may be green or brown in color. The stem connects the roots to the other parts of the plant. It grows upward toward the sunlight. It also carries water from the roots up to the leaves. It supports the whole plant. It must be tough to withstand the force of strong winds. There are two kinds of stems, woody stems and herbaceous stems. Woody stems are non-green stems that are thick and hard. They are covered with bark. The bark is the rough, outer covering of a woody stem. Trees, shrubs, and some vines have woody stems. They continue to produce wood and bark as they grow. Here are some plants with woody stems. 1. Trees are tall plants with one big stem called a trunk. They have hard, woody, and branching stems. Examples of trees are mango, jackfruit, tamarind, and acacia. 2. Shrubs are woody plants with short and hard stems branching near the ground. Examples of shrubs are santan, rose, and gumamela. 3. Some vines have hard stems, but all vines cannot stand. They creep and cling on any solid objects or other plants for support. An example of a vine with a hard stem is batao. Herbaceous stems are soft and green stems. Plants with herbaceous stems usually do not grow as tall as plants with woody stems. Plants with herbaceous stems are called herbs. Examples of these herbs are cabbage, lettuce, pechai, and ferns. Herbaceous stems are not as strong as woody stems. Leaves the leaves of plants are usually green in color. This is because leaves have chlorophyll, the green coloring pigment that captures light energy from the sun. This energy is used in photosynthesis. The food which plants need in order to live and grow is manufactured in the leaves. Photosynthesis is the process in which plants absorb light energy from the sun and convert it into chemical energy stored as food. In photosynthesis, energy from the sun is used to combine water and carbon dioxide to make food. Water is absorbed by the roots and brought by the stem up to the leaves. Carbon dioxide enters the leaves through tiny openings called stomata. The food formed during photosynthesis is composed of starch. Without food, plants cannot live. Let us examine the parts of a leaf. The parts of a leaf are the blade, vein, midrib, and petiole. The expanded portion of the leaf is called the leaf blade. The leaf blade helps in absorbing energy from the sun. At the middle part of the leaf blade is a midrib with its branches called veins. The petiole is the leaf stalk that connects the leaf to the stem. Some plants have stipules. They look like two small leaflets at the base of the stalk. Kinds of leaves Leaves may be simple or compound. A simple leaf has only one leaf blade attached to a petiole. Examples of these kind of leaf are the guava and San Francisco leaves. 
A compound leaf consists of many leaf blades attached to one petiole. Examples of this kind of leaf are the acacia and malungay leaves. Characteristics of leaves The leaves of plants differ in many characteristics. Leaves differ in the shape of their margins or edges. Leaves with margins or edges that look like a saw are called toothed. Leaves having smooth edges are called entire. Leaves with irregular edges are called lobed. Leaves differ in the kind of venation they have. Venation is the arrangement of veins in the leaf. Veins are small tubes that carry food and water in a leaf. Look closely at the veins of the leaves. These are two kinds of venation, parallel and netted. If a pair of leaves arises from a single node, the leaf arrangement is called opposite. The santan plant has an opposite arrangement of leaves. If there is one leaf attached at each node on each side of the stem, the leaf arrangement is called alternate. Gumamelas have an alternate arrangement of leaves. If three or more leaves arise from the single node of the stem, the leaf arrangement is called world. Aloe veras have a world arrangement of leaves. Leaves of plants have different shapes, broad leaves, needle leaves, and narrow leaves. 1. Broad leaves. These are wide and flat leaves, often with a visible network of veins. Examples of plants with broad leaves are mahogany, bird of paradise, and banana. Some gardeners use these types of plants for ornamental purposes. 2. Narrow leaves. These leaves are long and slender and without a wide blade. Examples of plants with narrow leaves are grasses, corn, wheat, onions, fortune plants, and bamboo. 3. Needle leaves. These leaves are similar to sewing needles. They are thin, pointed, and ranging from 1 inch long to 5 inches long. They are well adapted for growth in a dry environment. Examples are pines and spruces. Flowers. Not all plants bear flowers. Plants that bear flowers are called flowering plants. Many flowers are brightly colored and fragrant to attract insects, which help in the process of pollination. Characteristics of flowers. Flowers differ in their size, texture, color, and fragrance. Flowers have different sizes. They may be small, medium-sized, or big. Which flower you know is big? Which is small? Flowers have different colors. They may be red, orange, yellow, pink, violet, or white. Flowers have different scents or smells. Some flowers may be fragrant like the Sampaguita and Camia. Some flowers have no smell like the bird of paradise. Other flowers have a bad smell. A flower smell or fragrance comes from its petals. Fragrant flowers differ in the texture of their petals. Some petals are soft and smooth to touch while others are hard and rough. Flowers with brightly colored petals are usually pollinated by insects like bees and butterflies. Those that have a foul smell are pollinated by houseflies. Flowers that are not brightly colored and do not have fragrance are usually pollinated by wind and water. Parts of flowers. Flowers are made up of the following parts. Petals, sepals, pistil, stamen, receptacle, and flower stalk. The petals are the colorful parts of a flower. The sepals are smaller than the petals and are green in color. 
The petals and sepals are held together by the receptacle. The male and female organs of the flower are found in the middle of the petals. The pistil is a female organ of the flower, while the stamen is a male organ. Flowers that have both stamens and pistils are called perfect flowers. The morning glory and gumamela are examples of perfect flowers. If a flower lacks either the stamen or pistil, it is an imperfect flower. The flowers of the papaya plant are imperfect. Fruits Flowering plants produce seeds. They store food in their seeds. This stored food nourishes the plant embryo inside the seed. The part of the plant that contains the seeds is called the fruit. It is the ripened ovary of a flower. Fruits are either fleshy or dry. They also vary in size, shape, and color. Oranges, mangoes, chicos, and pomelos are some examples of fruits. Seeds Seeds are very important. The life of a new plant begins with a seed. Some seeds are small, while others are big. A seed has a baby plant inside. Wrapped around the baby plant are the cotyledons. The cotyledons store food. The baby plant uses the food in the cotyledons until it grows up from the seed and is ready to make its own food. The baby plant uses the food in the cotyledon until it grows up from the seed and is ready to make its own food. The baby plant consists of two parts, the leaf bud and the root bud. As the seed gets water, the baby plant breaks the seed cover and sprouts. The root bud grows downward and the leaf bud grows and pushes upward to form a stem. Leaves grow and develop from the stem. Flowering plants are classified according to the number of their seed leaves or cotyledons. Plants that produce seed with one seed leaf are called monocotyledons or monocots. Corn and rice are monocots. Plants that produce seed containing two seed leaves are called dicotyledons or dicots. Nuts and beans are dicots. Science Laboratory Tools Study the different science laboratory tools and their uses. A microscope is an optical instrument that enlarges images of minute objects that cannot be seen by the unaided eye. A magnifying glass is an instrument used for observing tiny objects. Test tubes are used for heating small amounts of liquid. A test tube holder is a metallic device used to hold a test tube while being heated over a flame. A graduated cylinder is used for measuring the volume of liquids like water, oil, and other solutions. An alcohol lamp is used for heating materials. An evaporating dish is a porcelain dish used in evaporating chemical solutions. A beaker is a thin glass vessel used as container for fluids. It has graduation for the measurement of volume. A thermometer is used for measuring temperature. A funnel is a device used when pouring liquids or fine particles to a small mouthed container to avoid spilling. Earning air flask with stirrer on a hot plate heats the liquid with continuous stirring. Litmus paper is used in identifying if the liquid is an acid or base. 
Table beam balance is used in getting the mass of objects. A digital microscope provides a different feel and sight at proving the structures of a cell. Mortar and pestle are used in grinding materials such as leaves in a chromatography experiment. Telescope is used for looking at objects that are a great distance away. A test tube rock is used to hold multiple test tubes upright at the same time. They are especially useful for organizing test tubes when different solutions are being worked on or collected at once. A compound microscope. A very important device that is used in a science laboratory is the microscope. A device that gives an enlarged picture of tiny objects. Let us study the parts of a compound microscope as seen from the picture on the right. A compound microscope has an optical system, a mechanical system, and a light system. The lenses which make up the optical system of the compound microscope are usually two or more objective lenses of different magnifying powers. A low-power objective is used first to locate the region of the specimen to be examined. If further magnification is wanted, a high-power objective is then moved into position. The microscope usually has just one eyepiece or ocular. However, in some cases, the ocular or eyepiece may be removed and replaced by another of different power. Usually, you will find three or four objective lenses on a microscope. They almost always consist of 4x, 10x, 40x, and 100x powers. When coupled with the 10x most common eyepiece lens, you get total magnifications of 40x, 4x times 10x, and you can still increase the magnification to 100x, 400x and 1000x just by combining two lenses. Meanwhile, the condenser lens is used to focus light onto the specimen. Condenser lenses are most useful at the highest powers, 400x and above. The mechanical system consists of the structural parts that hold the specimen and lenses and permit focusing of the image. The tube connects the eyepiece to the objective lenses, while the arm supports the tube and connects it to the base that is at the bottom of the microscope to provide support. The stage is the flat platform where you place your slides, and the stage clips hold them in place. The revolving nose piece or turret is a part that holds two or more objective lenses and can be rotated to easily change power. The light system consists basically of illuminator or mirror and diaphragm or iris. An illuminator is a steady light source, 110 volts, used in place of a mirror. If your microscope has a mirror, it is used to reflect light from an external light source up through the bottom of the stage. The diaphragm or iris is a rotating disc under the stage. This diaphragm has different size holes and is used to vary the intensity and size of the cone of light that is projected upward into the slide. How to use a microscope? When using the microscope, remember the following. Make sure the microscope is steady with its base sitting on a flat, stable surface. Notice the eyepiece at the top. This eyepiece fits into the tube of the microscope. Adjust the mirror near the base of the microscope so that the right amount of light is sent up to the tube. Put the microscope slide on the stage with the material to be viewed over the hole in the stage. Use the stage clips to hold the slide in place. 
There are two or three objective lenses attached to the nose piece at the base of the tube. One is low power, one is medium power, and the others are medium or high power. Always use the low power objective first. Turn the nose piece until the lens clicks into place. Look through the eyepiece and turn the course adjustment knob to move the lowest power objective lens down close to the stage. Look through the eyepiece and turn the course adjustment knob until your specimen is in focus. Turn the fine adjustment knob to make the focus clearer if needed. Change the objective lens from low to medium or high. Be sure that the objective lenses do not hit the stage when you rotate them into place. This could scratch the fragile lenses or break the slide.